Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Modern Drive Show. Welcome back to our continued coverage of the Russia and Ukraine crisis. Today, together, we are going to experience what it is like to evacuate Ukraine, um, specifically by train. This is a 10 minute video of, I believe, a reporter just going on an evacuation train, interviewing other people, and just giving us the closest experience that either of us can have to actually leaving Ukraine. So let's get into it. This is uh, an evacuation train. It's heading from eastern Ukraine to uh, the western city of Lviv. It has at least 1,100 passengers on it. We just stopped somewhere and it took on more passengers. I've been speaking with this family here. They just fled from... We is Takmaka. So they just came from the town of Takmak. Uh, Okay, and they said that they left their homes behind, that it's a Russian-occupied town, and they went through checkpoints, many Russian checkpoints, that the men in their group were searched, their phones were all checked, uh, and it was terribly frightening, and there were uh, moments of shooting where the Russian forces were shooting, uh, and it was a, a terrifying situation. So you have a whole group of relatives here that are gathered. Um, I don't know if you can... St so, already... Um you can see, I mean, the lady on the right specifically, you can just see the tiredness on her face, the exhaustion, the desensitization that she's had to undergo in her own brain just to mentally survive this. Um, you know, you're considered the enemy, and as we're going to get into later, you know, Russia is bordering on the line of genocide now, so... You're literally a targeted group of people having to go through essentially Nazi checkpoints in hopes that you're not going to be murdered. Um, it's a blessing that they even made it this far. I'm sure they've seen countless deaths. So initially this experience just to get to this evacuation train is frightening, exhausting, and doesn't seem to have the easiest survival rate, especially as a man. Still hear me, John. Can you just check in? Yes. Because I lost my connection for a yes, second. Yes, Ivan, I hear you. Keep going. Great. So, okay. Uh, so, this woman is saying that they are putting pressure, psychological pressure on the people there. This woman was just saying that they go house to house searching. These are families... And she is accusing Russian troops of raping Ukrainian women. Uh, okay, so now... Uh, this is 21st century war in its finest. Um, it's disgusting, it's brutal, and it's horrific. Um, death is, of course, the headline, but... You know, from the conquistadors, um, for sure, I can't for sure say Romans and Greeks, but one can assume just based on human history, um, I believe even Americans, um, many soldiers are guilty of raping women on their journeys and doing awful, awful, awful things. And now that um, we are in a you know, 21st century era of technology where all of this is documented um, live. We know all this uh, instantly. It's not just in history books. And f it seems like at least for once, a lot of these people will be brought to justice. Um, it's a damn shame, dude. Uh you know, someone's invading their country, they're, they're occupying, searching everything you have, going door to door, you might get raped, like, there's no words for this. Often, uh, killed them after. And killed them after. Did you see or hear about? I hear about this from my friends, um, from girls who I know, and it was just terrible stories, and they left some marks on their bodies and I saw these pictures and it was terrible pictures in my life. What is your name? 
30. And how old are you? Uh, 28. And you finally decided to leave with your family. What was it yes. that finally pushed um, you? Uh, because I'm just worried. Just worried and my... Uh, I have very old granny and my mother don't want to leave her alone. And I decided to go alone because I'm very afraid to stay there. And it's hard, man. Um, you know... She decided to leave her entire family. Her mom, her dad, the ones who raised her, her friends for her entire life. You know, they're like, not all of them, but it seems like a lot of them are saying, nah, I'm, I'm not leaving. This is where I'm from. This is where I'm going to stay. You see a lot of Ukrainians going back to help. And there's no right or wrong answer. Each one is just going to be drawn to their own um, destiny in all reality. But she had to leave behind her parents and everything, and she's not going to know whether her own mother is going to be murdered or even raped. And I, I honestly put those in the same category, just understanding what each of those things do. Um, it's rough, man. It's absolutely, absolutely horrific. And it's a tragedy for this woman who at 28 years old is going to have to leave everything behind and start over, and she may never have any of it back ever again. How many weeks were you living under Russian occupation? Mm, month, month. A month. Yes, yes. Uh, they occupied our uh, city from the 27 uh, February, mm -hmm. and from this day we all feel this pressure. Are you? Do you feel better now that you are out of Russian-controlled territory? I felt better territory? after we leave uh, our city already, because I understand everything already will be much better for me. But I am very worried about my family there. You left family behind. Yes, and family, my um, home, my apartment, my pets. And what would you like to tell people right now about crazy. the conditions Everything. when the Russian military occupies your town in Ukraine? I want um, them, all these people just trying to leave these places if they have this opportunity. Because there is really terrible and I'm sure they will remember this forever and their kids will remember this forever. And um, I, I'm not sure our nation deserves all of this. And Your nation didn't deserve all of this. Uh, I mean, when the majority of the world agrees that your country doesn't deserve this, and the countries that disagree are doing inhumane things, not all of them, but some of them, um, you know... The perspective is kind of given. I mean, it's decided for you. Your country didn't do anything wrong, and you definitely don't deserve this. And I highlight this every time it's said because. And I want we all uh, come back here. We all want this. We all want come back just because we love Ukraine. We love our people. We all love our streets and builds and we are ready. Okay. Yes, we just uh, lost everything. I'm so sorry, Katya. I'm glad you're safe. It's Katya, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Katya. so this is Katya from Tokmak, 28 years old, who has lived for a... Oh, minutesko, please. Who has lived for a month under Russian military occupation until fleeing yesterday. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back. Uh-huh. And this woman says... This woman says that their town, Tokmak, is Russian-speaking, there are no Nazis there. 
Спасибо вам всем и удачи. Счастливого пути. So, John, uh, this just one family in a very crowded train car, in a train with at least 1,100 passengers, evacuees. This is happening daily from different points in eastern Ukraine, civilians leaving uh, to head towards western... Uh, for places in the west uh, of the country. Um, and uh, it's, it's part of the, just this mass of humanity that's been on the move. All right, uh, Ivan's shot is frozen there. Bear with us. Ivan is on a moving train right now. He's leaving this part of Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, where the Russians appear to be intensifying their attacks. And what you just saw was remarkable, remarkable reporting. Ivan speaking to people live on this evacuation train, flee. Seeing the town which has been under occupation, this family, all women, telling them they've heard stories of women being raped and then killed and then disfigured by the Russian troops, telling stories about the Russians going door to door inside those towns, uh, and now finally feeling this group of people that they have to go. The situation has become so unsafe that they have to go. And to hear Ivan speaking with them live as they are fleeing in both English and Russian, I might say, uh, was, was something to behold, a window I think, into the terror, Brianna, the live, living, real terror that these people are going through. Again, um, Ivan, please tell us uh, what else you're seeing. Well, I mean, the train's made a stop now, and we've picked up other passengers along the way. I'm not sure whether we're picking them up here. Um, a little bit more about, you know, the rail system in Ukraine. Before the war, 50% of all passengers, uh, of all transport of passengers in this country was on the railroad system. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest in Europe. So it's been essential to evacuating people from these areas. Now, the crew on board this train they were on the last train to leave the currently besieged uh, southeastern city of Mariupol on the 25th of February. So all of these workers, about 20 of them, they all had homes and cars and lives and pets and family in Mariupol that they left on the 25th. They've never been able to go back. They worked. for a month straight on trains, evacuating huge numbers of people. The, the, the director of the train estimates about 100,000 plus people in uh, uh, the course of a month working nonstop. Um, and that's just one crew uh, of rail workers. Uh, there's another detail I'd like to share. According to the Ukrainian government, uh, there were, when the Russians invaded, about 15,000 Russian railway cars on Ukrainian territory, presumably moving uh, cargo back and forth, perhaps to Ukraine, perhaps to Europe. And they're all stuck on Ukrainian territory. The Ukrainian government is planning to nationalize those train cars. And the government says there were less than 500 Ukrainian cars in Russia when the war started. That kind of indicates the lack of preparation in some <laughs> and thought about Russian property that would be in the country that it invaded.